the respiratory system moves air through the nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchus to the alveoli where the gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs. Nares are the openings to the nose. The nasal cavity is lined with cilia, mucous membranes, and blood capillaries. The air is filtered by cilia, moistened by mucous membranes, and warmed by the blood. Air moves into the pharynx or throat, the common passageway for food and air. Air continues on to the larynx. The epiglottis, a flap of tissue in front of the larynx, closes off the larynx when swallowing to prevent food from entering. The larynx, or voice box, contains the vocal folds. The trachea, or windpipe, connects the larynx to the bronchial tree. The cartilage rings of the trachea prevent the trachea from collapsing. Lungs are spongy tissue with alveoli and blood capillaries. Breathing occurs because of the expansion and contraction of the lungs. The bronchi carrying the air subdivide into smaller branches called bronchioles. At the end of each bronchial are the alveolar sacs. The alveolar sacs are surrounded by blood capillaries and contain millions of single-layer alveoli cells where the gas exchange takes place. Oxygenated air goes from the nose to the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchus, and alveoli. By the process of diffusion, oxygen in the air moves from the alveoli to the capillaries. Carbon dioxide moves from the capillaries to the alveoli and is exhaled. This process is called respiration. Inspiration. The pressure in the lungs is decreased and the air rushes in. The muscles of the diaphragm contract to make it descend. The rib cage moves upwards and outwards. Expiration. The pressure in lungs is increased and the air is pushed out. The diaphragm becomes dome shaped relaxes and moves up. Simultaneously, the rib cage moves down and in. Fresh air entering the lung carries oxygen with a PO2 of 160. The presence of moisture in the lung results in reduction of the PO2 to 104. Fresh air entering the lung carries carbon dioxide with a PCO2 of 0 0.3. The carbon dioxide delivered to the lung from the blood raises the PCO2 to 40. At the arterial ends of the pulmonary capillaries, oxygen diffuses from the air in the alveoli into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the alveoli because of differences in partial pressures. As a result of diffusion, at the venous ends of the pulmonary capillaries, the PO2 in the blood is equal to the PO2 in the alveoli and the PCO2 in the blood is equal to the PCO2 in the alveoli. With no differences in partial pressure, there is no more net movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide. Oxygen diffuses out of the arterial ends of tissue capillaries into the tissue fluid, then into the cells, and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cells into the tissue fluid, then into the blood, because of differences in partial pressures. At the venous ends of tissue capillaries, the PO2 in the blood is equal to the PO2 in the tissue fluid, and the PCO2 in the blood is equal to the PCO2 in the tissue fluid, resulting in no more net movement of oxygen or carbon dioxide. The blood now carries the oxygen and carbon dioxide to the lungs. In the body, all of these exchanges occur simultaneously. All cells need oxygen. It is the essential fuel which is necessary to enable cells to stay alive and to carry out their various activities. Bringing oxygen to the cells requires the uptake of oxygen from the air in the lungs, its transportation in the blood, and its delivery to cells all over the body. 
The first step is the taking up of oxygen by blood flowing through fine capillaries in the walls of the lungs air sacs or alveoli. The oxygen molecules change from their state as a gas freely circulating in the air dissolving into a solution in the plasma within the capillaries of the alveoli. Once in the solution of the blood, 98% of this dissolved oxygen is taken up by passing red cells, leaving just 2% remaining in the physical solution unattached. Red cells are particularly well suited to transporting oxygen because they contain a special oxygen binding protein known as hemoglobin. Each molecule of hemoglobin itself contains four molecules of heme, an iron-containing pigment, which binds oxygen loosely and reversibly. Hemoglobin that is fully saturated with oxygen is bright red and is called oxyhemoglobin. On the other hand, hemoglobin that is not saturated with oxygen is purplish-blue in color and is called deoxyhemoglobin. It is heme which makes it possible for the red cells to pick up oxygen dissolved in the blood, transport it combined with hemoglobin, and release it back into the blood as oxygen in solution, ready for delivery to the various cells of the body. Hemoglobin gives up its oxygen as red cells travel through capillaries in tissues where there is a low content or partial pressure of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen represents the level of dissolved oxygen in plasma. As oxygen is released and again is carried in solution, the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries becomes greater than the partial pressure of oxygen in the surrounding tissues. This causes oxygen to move out of the capillaries into the tissues and to finally reach the cells. This graph, the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin, shows why hemoglobin is particularly suited to its role in transporting oxygen. The oxygen dissociation curve demonstrates the relationship between the oxygen carried in combination with hemoglobin. The O2 saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. The sharp upstroke and the flat plateau illustrate how oxygen is released to the tissues over a wide range of conditions. Its shape means that although the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood returning from the lungs and being pumped out by the arteries may be reduced to only 50% of the normal value, say due to lung disease or high altitude, hemoglobin will still be 85% saturated with oxygen.